This episode may contain content of a graphic nature, including descriptions of physical and sexual violence against adults, children, and animals. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everyone, I'm Talia. And I'm Tanya. And together we are Crimes and Consequences, a true crime podcast. Hi, Tanya. Hi, Talia. Welcome back, everybody, to Crimes and Consequences. I have a story I can't wait to share with you. This one includes 911 phone calls. You know how much I love 911 phone calls. You do. These particular 911 phone calls, I don't like that much because the guy's voice is so annoying. (laughs) So annoying. You're going to hate them. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. I'm going to ask everybody to hit the subscribe or follow button on whatever app you're listening to us on right now because that really does help. And with that being said, I'm ready. Okay, let's hear it. On New Year's Eve in 1980, there was a 21-year-old college student. Her name was Karen. And she went to the University of Wisconsin in Stevens Point. Never been there. On that New Year's Eve, Karen was really excited. She was going to go back home to St. Paul, Minnesota, and she was going to spend the evening with her sisters and some friends. They were going to go to a party. So she gets ready. They all get ready, and they go to a party. It's not too far from her parents' home. It was around 1 a.m. when Karen's sisters noticed that she wasn't at the party anymore. Only minutes earlier, unbeknownst to them, Karen had decided in a very drunken state to walk home alone. Oh, shit. And she failed to tell anyone. Oh, no. She stepped outside into the dark, snowy night without even a jacket on. I mean, she was... Drunk. Yeah, it was New Year's Eve. Probably didn't feel it. Exactly. Exactly. I was thinking the same. I was thinking the same thing. The walk wasn't too far, but it was only 28 degrees outside, and the snow was falling down on her. So even if she is completely shit-faced, eventually you're going to feel that cold. Karen stumbled down Syndicate Street and towards this industrial alleyway that would serve as a shortcut to get home. As she wandered down the street, headlights from this beige sedan grew closer. The car pulled up next to her and the driver, he was a really unassuming man, he rolled down his window and he asked her if she wanted a warm ride home. She's like, hell yes. Hell yeah, I am freezing and I'm drunk. He thought maybe she'd like to get a cup of coffee. Being that her judgment was askew and that the bitter winter air was getting to her, she agreed and she got into the passenger side of the vehicle. As the man switched gears, something in his mind snapped and he ambushed Karen, catching her completely off guard. They were near the Malberg Manufacturing Company. And it was completely desolate. I mean, it's the middle of the night on New Year's Eve. So there was no one around to hear Karen scream. At roughly 3 a.m., a man in a payphone called 911 to report that there was an emergency. A woman was hurt at the Malberg Manufacturing Company out on Pierce Butler Route. In a panicked voice, he told police that they needed to send a squad car and an ambulance. He said she was laying injured behind the machine shop next to an old railroad track. When the dispatcher inquired about the caller's identity, he hung up. Here is a recording of this very disturbing 911 call. Yes, please. This is an emergency. Please send a squad to Pierce Butler Road, Malmberg Manufacturing Company machine shop. Please, there's an ambulance too. There's a girl hurt there. Can you tell me what happened to her? 
the tree, there's a chicken laying on the ground in the back by the, by the railroad tracks, by the edge of the tree. What, what's the address? I don't know. Who are you? He sounds like a whiny woman. He sounds like one of my kids. I <laughs> Calling me up whining. Hurry, just please come. <laughs> oh, that was a really good impression. Thank you. Police arrived very quickly on the scene, using their flashlights to illuminate the black night, because it's dark out there. They searched the wooded area behind the Malberg Manufacturing Company, and they quickly came upon the body of a young woman. She was naked, laying on top of the snow that was now stained red from her blood. The woman was next to an old railroad track, just as the caller said she would be. And of course, the victim was later identified as 20-year-old Karen Potek. And she had suffered a brutal beating. Her head had been repeatedly smashed with a tire iron at least 15 times. Oh, my God. It crushed her skull and exposed her brain. Oh, fuck. The police literally could see her brain. Oof. As they approached her, they discovered she was still breathing. Oh, my God. Are you kidding? No, she was barely clinging to life. She wasn't conscious, obviously, right? She's not conscious. Karen was rushed to the hospital where she underwent long hours of emergency surgery. And no one expected her to survive this ferocious attack. But she managed to pull through. Get out of here. She did. And eventually she regained consciousness. How was her mental state? Did she suffer brain damage? I'm not sure what her long-term injuries were. I can imagine a lot of physical therapy, but I don't know. I don't know. Holy shit. I do know that the major head trauma caused her to have no recollection of the attack on her, and she couldn't provide them any details of the perpetrator. The only clue investigators had was that phone call made to them. Months went by, and the police were no closer to catching the culprit than when they first received that ridiculous call from him. But that all changed six months later on June 3rd in 1981. Kimberly Compton, she went by Kim. She just graduated from high school and was excited to head out into the world on her own. On Wednesday, June 3rd, and this is 81, she took a bus from her hometown of Pepin, Wisconsin. Never heard of it. Nope. To St. Paul. And it's about an hour and 20 minutes away. She was going to hit the streets in search of a job. And I'm not sure exactly why, but I know she had a bag with some clothes. I don't know anything more than what I just told you. And I did a lot of research on this case. Kim exited the bus. She put that bag that I just described to you in one of the depot's lockers. And she walked across the street to Mickey's Diner. I don't know if she was looking for a job there or getting a bite to eat. But she was at Mickey's Diner, and while she was there, a balding man who was sipping on some coffee began to make some small talk with her. When she told him she was new in town, he offered to give her a tour of the city. She's young. She's naive. And she didn't hesitate to take him up on it. That decision would cost him her life. Oh, man. At first, the man convinced himself that his intentions were good. He would take her towards the Mississippi River for maybe a picnic. Or perhaps he would show her the Delta Queen steamboat docked by the shore. But something in him was calling out to kill her. It was this voice urging him to end her life. They never made it to the river. Within 15 minutes of Kim getting into his rusted beige sedan, she was dead. That was quick. I know. I mean, damn. 15 minutes. Shortly thereafter, a group of boys were playing in this field. And the field was described as being near an interstate that was being developed. So they're playing in this field when they come across the bloody remains of a young woman. She's laying face down near what would end up being Interstate 35 East. Her body was clad in the same jean shorts and red jacket she'd been wearing when she left the bus stop. Around the same time the boys discovered Kim's body, 911 received a very disturbing call from a man claiming to be Kim's killer. In this call, he pleads with them to stop him. And I'm going to play it for you. 
Oh, you find me? I just stabbed somebody with an ice pick. I can't stop myself. I keep killing somebody. So that's their second call from <laughs> what this the weirdo. Fuck, dude? I have no idea. <sighs> Man. The call was traced to a payphone across the street from the bus depot where Kim had been at earlier, next to the Mickey's Diner. Kim's autopsy indicated that she'd been stabbed 61 times. Holy shit. Mainly in the chest with an ice pick. Ooh. And if you think about it, an ice pick is a relatively rare weapon for a killer, mostly because it's pretty ineffective. Because it's so thin, probably, right? It's so thin and little. And you have to... Do it 61 times. Yeah, seriously. You have to do it a lot. Mm -hmm. One of her shoelaces was wrapped around her neck. It had been used to strangle her into unconsciousness. It was never revealed by investigators if she'd been sexually assaulted or not. So I don't know. But you do remember that Karen was found naked. And again, they never said if she was sexually assaulted or not. So I don't know. Hmm. On June 6th, the same annoying, so, so annoying voice contacted the police again, crying to them. Telling them he didn't mean to kill her. He explained that he intended on turning himself in to authorities very soon. Soon after that, he reached out to the local newspaper and called them. And in that same whiny voice, he corrected them on some of the inaccuracies in the report they did on Kim's death. Really? Why? Because he's an asshole. Yeah, right? That's what that's, that's just really weird. He clearly likes the attention. Mm -hmm. In case you thought he was done reaching out to people, he's not done. He called the police again on June 11th, expressing his sorrow and deep remorse for the killing of Kim. He apologized for not turning himself in. And he said something like, don't talk, just listen. I'm sorry for what I did to Kim Compton. I don't know why I did it. It's like a big dream. Then he explains why he doesn't turn himself in. It's because he can't be locked up. If he got locked up, he would have to kill himself. Well, does anybody really want to be locked up? I mean, come on. I guess he just needs to explain to police. I guess. <laughs> Here is a clip of that 911 call. Don't talk. Just listen. I'm sorry what I did to Compton. I couldn't help it. Don't know why I had this tavern. I am so upset about it. I keep getting drunk every day and I can't believe it. It's like a big dream. I just, I can't think of being locked up. If I get locked up, I'll kill myself. I'd rather kill myself than get locked up. I'll be trying not to kill anybody else. Still annoying, still whining. Eventually, the recordings were released to the media in the hope someone would recognize this madman's voice and report him. Over 150 tips came in, but none of them provided any leads at all. Wow. They still had no idea who was responsible for Kim's murder and the attack on Karen. For over a year, this pathetic killer seemed to have successfully restrained his sadistic, murderous ways. He said he was going to try to stop killing people. He's going to try. And he did. But on August 6th of 1982, he couldn't contain that monster anymore. It was a Thursday night, and 40-year-old Barbara Simons, she was a nurse from Minneapolis, she went out. She wanted to unwind. She went to her usual spot called the Hexagon Bar. While she was there, a man approached her and bummed a cigarette from her. She danced with him for a while, and the two had some drinks. At one point, she commented to the waitress, saying, quote, He's cute. I hope he's a good guy because I need a ride home. Oh, shit. But of course, he wasn't a good guy. And that ride home didn't take her home, but put her in a grave. Before I tell you more, we're going to take a really quick break. So we're back. As I said, Barbara didn't get taken home. Instead, the next morning, a newspaper carrier came upon. Barbara's body under some trees and some brush on the banks of the Mississippi River. She was laying on her back in the same red jeans, red shirt, and black heels that she was wearing at the Hexagon Bar the night before. 
Barbara was the victim of a severe beating, and she'd been stabbed 106 times with an ice pick. Oh, man. Fuck. Right. One article I read said she'd been raped, too, but I don't know if that's true or not. Two days later, investigators, can you guess what they received? A phone call? They did. A 911 call? A 911 call from a very whiny voice that they recognized. In this call, he feigned sorrow and regret for her killing, but he made sure police knew that he was also responsible for the killing of Kimberly Compton a year earlier. He refers to her as Compton. He cries about not knowing what is the matter with him. He's sick. And he threatens to kill himself. In fact, he says if someone dies with a red shirt on, it's him. He couldn't just leave, I guess, a suicide note saying, I'm the killer. (laughs) So he's going to wear a red shirt when he kills himself? Yeah, that's what he said. Now, Tanya, I'm going to play that 911 call. Some of it's a little hard to understand because he's crying and whining so much. He's very concerned that he's not going to make it to heaven. Um, I think we're past that right right now. And I don't believe that his crying is sincere. I think it's just faking it by calling in. It's just another way for him to get attention for the crime. That's my take on it. And I'm going to play part of it for you. Okay. Fire emergency. Please don't talk to this I'm sorry. I killed that girl. I said this 40 times. Kimberly Compton was the first one. Oh, my face. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm sick. I'm going to kill myself. I'm sick. Where are you? I'm just going to. There's so many guys with a red shirt on. It's me. I killed both of you. I'm sorry. I'm going to be in the house. Calm down. Calm During their investigation, St. Paul police were able to retrace Barbara's steps back to the Hexagon bar, and they talked with that waitress that Barbara had turned to and said, oh, I hope he's a good guy because he's going to take me home. That waitress said that because Barbara had said that to her, she actually took a second to really look at the guy. And she described him as being about 40, six feet tall, 185 to 200 pounds, He had a receding hairline and a brown mustache. This waitress was shown over a hundred mug shots before she finally stopped the police and said, this is the guy. She immediately recognized him as the man that left with Barbara. His name was Paul Stefani. He was a 37-year-old janitor. He was divorced and he had a young daughter that he abandoned. He's a dick. Piece of shit. In case you thought he'd be some outstanding (laughs) member of society. He'd been arrested and convicted previously of aggravated assault, and he had been treated for unspecified mental health issues. Paul never seemed to keep a job for very long, and he blamed his constant firings on his epilepsy. It was more than a coincidence that three years earlier, he'd been fired from Malberg Manufacturing Company, the spot where Karen had been found barely clinging to life. I'm just going to briefly go into a little bit of a background about Paul. Really don't want to waste my time on this loser. He grew up in Austin, Minnesota. He never knew his biological father. And at the age of three, his mother remarried. He ended up being one of 10 children. And his stepfather and mom became devoted to the Catholic Church. And they raised their children in a very strict Catholic upbringing. That's all you need to know about him. Okay. Police decided to put surveillance on Paul since they had no solid evidence to connect him to the murder, so they didn't have enough to arrest him. That very next evening, Paul left his house in an unmarked police car, followed after him. But they lost him. Oh, man. That's not the first story we've done where they've lost him. Mm -hmm. We've done a couple, and I'm like, damn, because it doesn't end up good. Now he had free reign to strike again, which he took advantage of. That August evening, 19-year-old Denise Williams was turning tricks on Hennepin Avenue in Minneapolis when a man approached her in a beige sedan. He offered her $100 to, quote, have some fun, end quote, with him. Denise had a hard life. I feel bad for her. She grew up on the streets. She began turning to prostitution to support herself at the age of 13. Oh, man. I know, that's just... 
Oh, so poor girl. sad. And you know, by the time she's 19, she's seen so much shit. Mm-hmm. To her, Paul was just another John, just another dollar. He seemed harmless enough. I mean, you heard his voice. Right. <laughs> Couldn't hurt a fly. She considered herself pretty tough, so she agreed. She hopped into his car, and he said, would you mind going back to my apartment in St. Paul? She's like, okay. Once at the apartment, he gave her only $40, and he promised he would pay her the rest later. Um, no. How? What a jerk. I know. Desperate for money, she went ahead and the two engaged in intercourse. He was kind enough to offer a ride back downtown to where he'd picked her up from. But instead of taking the quickest route on the freeway, he took an indirect route through the back roads. Oh, no. Denise didn't recognize the way, and she began feeling uneasy. To add to her discomfort, this asshole began describing in detail to her his sexual fantasies. Oh, fuck. Which really creeped her out. I don't know what they were, but they were creepy. The roads were dark, and Denise asked Paul, what street are we on? He told her Hannapin Avenue. And they actually were. She just didn't recognize it because of the route he took. He then drove a few more blocks. He turned down a dead-end road and into a parking lot. It seemed pretty isolated. He stopped abruptly, put the car in park, turned to Denise, and in a sharp tone told her, quote, some ass, grass, or gas. Hey, we've heard that one before. Yes. From um, Whips and Chains. Whips and Chains, our Patreon episode on Randy Rhodes. Yes. Apparently that was a saying. Back then. I know a couple of our members did comment on that episode. They're like, oh, yeah. Like one of them had a t-shirt, I think, that said it. And I had never heard that phrase before. Me either until Randy Rhodes came along. And then now we have it again. He also told her, quote, no one rides for free. End quote. What the I feel fuck? like she already yeah. paid for that ride. And, and she didn't owe- get all her money. Yeah, he owes her. Yeah, he owes her. Denise was desperate to try to get out of that car. I mean, I kind of can't blame her. But as she attempted to leave, he grabbed her left hand and he stabbed her <gasps> in the stomach with a Phillips screwdriver. Oh. Oh. Right. Oh. That doesn't go in easy. No, it doesn't. Paul continued stabbing her and Denise fell back in the seat. She felt around and found a glass pop bottle on the floor of the car. She grabbed it and she hit him on the head with it. Good for her. She tried to hit him in the eye and managed to cut his cheek, head, and hand while he continued to stab her with a (gasps) screwdriver. He screamed in what the court records state was a high-pitched voice. (laughs) No shit. (laughs) Oh. That Denise was just like the rest of the other broads. Denise was scratching, biting, and kicking Paul in an effort to foil his attack. Paul then opened the passenger door. And you have to remember, they're struggling. So Mm -hmm. he, he somehow opens the passenger door, and they both fall out onto the pavement. He's now on top of her, and he's still stabbing her. Wow. Denise decided she wasn't going to win this fight because he's on her and he's got the screwdriver and she's wounded. So she tried to play dead. She said, I'm dying, I'm dying. And then she just laid there. But Paul continued to stab her. So she realized, okay, this isn't going to work. So she started screaming for help. And although Paul thought he was in a secluded area, he was wrong. There were a few houses nearby, but their lights were off, which is why Paul couldn't see them. Oh, yeah. Being that it was a hot summer night, one of those houses had its windows open. Denise's screams were heard by Doug Panning, who lived in the house with the open windows. Doug ran over to the parking lot, and he saw this blood on the pavement, and he witnessed Paul on top of Denise stabbing her with a screwdriver at least five or six times in quick succession. Wow. She was still holding the neck of the now broken pop bottle in her hand. Doug grabbed Paul's left arm in an attempt to thwart the stabbing. Paul jumped up. He stared at Doug. And then he started swinging at him with a screwdriver. Like, swinging at him? I don't know. That's what the court records use the word, swinging. Hmm. It's like, probably like a madman in a frenzy. Paul chased Doug to the end of the parking lot. Doug immediately ran home and he called the police. How about Doug being a badass? Doug? God bless Doug. Yes. 
so many people could have just stayed in the house and maybe mm-hmm. called the police or went back to bed. Right. But he did it Rambo style. I know. <laughs> Meanwhile, while Doug's on the phone with the police, Paul runs back to his car and he drives off. After calling the police, Doug went back to help Denise. Aww. He really is a badass. He really is. He later described in detail the four to five slow and deliberate stabbings he witnessed with a screwdriver. He noted that Paul had some difficulty piercing the weapon into the flesh. He was meeting with resistance. Oh, man. And had to use extreme force to accomplish the penetration. This is from the court records. Oh, my God. The resistance was such that Doug actually heard what he reported as a crunch of bones. The court noted that Paul's choice of a tool wasn't a knife designed to cut, but a Phillips screwdriver, which would require deliberate effort to cause damage. I mean, he didn't get an easy weapon. No. When the police arrived, Denise lied to them. She gave them a false name. She said her name was Mary Gross because she was afraid to use a real name. There was a warrant for her arrest. She'd been on probation, and she was supposed to go to a halfway house, but she skipped out on it. It's shocking to me because she's clearly the victim of an attempted murder, but she's just too afraid to even give her real name. Right. Like you said, you know she's seen some shit. Yeah. That's what I mean. I can't blame her. She was afraid that it would look even worse if she admitted that she was engaged in prostitution. So she made up a story about hitchhiking to a party in White Bear Lake and how Paul picked her up. And then he pulled over and made some advances and then she resisted and he stabbed her. She was taken to the hospital where she recovered from 15 puncture wounds. The injuries were to her lower right chest, her upper right abdomen, the right side of her head. One of the wounds punctured her lung and the other one punctured her liver. Meanwhile, you know what Paul did? What? I can't wait to tell you. (laughs) He went home and he was bleeding pretty bad from the cut on his head. Like she really got him. She broke that bottle on his head. So he thought, "Ah, I better call dispatch and get some help. (gasps) No, he didn't. He did. He called 911 and reported that he'd gotten beaten up. In his whiny voice? Yes. The 911 operator immediately recognized his voice and notified the police (laughs) that he was calling. He was picked up by an ambulance, taken to the hospital, treated for cuts on his head, hand, and cheek, and for an injury to his nose. And then, of course, he was arrested. (laughs) What? What a dumbass. Don't talk. Just listen. I got beat up. I got beat up. You really need to come help me. I don't have that call, but if I did, I would play it for everybody. But I'm sure it sounded just like that. I wish you had that one so I could sit here and make fun of it some more. A few days later, Denise gave her true name to the police and admitted that she, you know, created a false story about hitchhiking. There was a trial and the prosecutors felt like they had enough evidence to try Paul for the attack on Denise and for the murder of Barbara Simons. Because, you know, they had that witness, the waitress. But oh, yeah. they didn't feel like they had enough for Kim Compton and for Karen Potek. So they didn't try Paul for that. And at the time, they didn't know about the other murder I haven't told you about. Oh, man, there's another one? There's another one. Oh, shit. At a trial, he argued. You want to know his defense? <laughs> he argued that he was out with Denise. He picked her up. He was having an epileptic seizure. She took advantage of that and attacked him and tried to rob him. And that caused 15 stab wounds to her? Yeah. And keep in mind, Doug testified. Yeah. <laughs> There's no epileptic seizure. You don't Dude, have to go. Dude, you know, and- that's polishing the turd, man. We've talked about it. You got to polish that turd when you're an attorney sometimes. Paul's sister, she took the stand and they played the recordings of the 911 calls. They also played it for his ex wife and a former roommate. They all confirmed that it was his voice. And his sister, when she was on the stand, she just put her head down and covered her face. She was so upset. Paul was found guilty of both crimes. He got sentenced to 40 years for the murder of Barbara, 18 years for the attack on Denise, and 21 months for his second degree assault on Doug. (laughs) Whoa, he got. (laughs) For Doug, oh, that's awesome. So Paul's in prison. He's doing his time. 
And years go by. In 1997, Paul was diagnosed with melanoma, and it was terminal. He had terminal skin cancer. Apparently, he developed some sort of something that resembled a soul. He offered the St. Paul police a deal. He would tell them what happened to Kimberly Compton and Karen Potek in exchange for a photo of his mother's grave. She must have died while he was in prison, I'm guessing. They were like, yeah. Yeah, jump on that. Here's a photo. And they handed it to him. And once they did, he confessed to attacking Karen and murdering Kimberly. In addition, he admitted to the murder of a woman whose identity he didn't know. So he just gave him the details. And through the details that he provided, they were able to identify her as 33-year-old Kathleen Greening. She'd been drowned in a bathtub Wow! in her Lauderdale, Minnesota home. And that's in the metropolitan area of Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities. Let me tell you a little bit about that. This is after Kim Compton's murder, only a month after, when he'd said he was going to try really hard not to kill. Well, this is before Barbara Simons. Kathleen Greening, she went by Kathy. She was getting ready to go on a girl's trip to Mackinac Island. Oh, I fucking love Mackinac Island. She was a school teacher, and her friend Carol Koning showed up at her house that day. They were going to have breakfast, and then they were going to go on their way. Carol knocks on the door, and she gets no answer. She knew Kathy was supposed to be there. She notices the door's unlocked, so she lets herself in. She calls out for Kathy, and she doesn't get any response. So she's walking around the house, and when she does, she notices that the bathroom door is partially open and the light's on. So she goes inside the bathroom, and when she does, she finds Kathy laying naked and face up in the bathtub underwater. Oh, man. Her head was under the faucet and her knees were bent upward. Her cause of death was drowning. Some people thought it was an accident. Other people suspected it was murder, but they thought it was her ex-husband. There was never a connection to Paul Stefani. No, it's not his M.O. At all. At all. But when they reviewed the evidence in 1997, all the evidence they still had for Kathy, they noticed that in her address book, there was a name. It was Paul S. And there was a phone number next to it. And that was a phone number that Paul Stefani had at the time. Connection. For whatever reason, he never called the authorities to cry and whine about that one. Right. Like, maybe because it wasn't as violent. I don't know. That's just strange. I mean, it's totally not his MO. I can see how the police didn't think anything was connected to him. So in 1997, when he knows he's dying, he opens up about everything. He later said, killing, it seemed to me the thing you were supposed to do, that it was part of life. Driving a car was part of life. Eating food was part of life. To me, it seemed like killing was part of life until I did it, end quote. Then he said, quote, I'd rather go to the grave knowing this is all taken care of and off my chest. To this day, I can't believe it. I wake up in the morning thinking and hoping I'm dreaming all this. But then I say, no, Paul. You're still in jail. I don't know what to do except say I wish I could turn back the clock. Since I've been locked down, I've wondered how all this could happen. All I can say is I'm sick and I'm sorry. If sorry means anything after 15 years. So why do the investigators think that he did it? Like, why did he do it? The only thing they could come up with was before the killings, Paul was dumped by a girlfriend of his from Syria. She had an arranged marriage and had to go back to Syria. And this made him very upset. When Paul was attacking the victims, according to one detective, his name is Detective Brown, he was actually attacking his former girlfriend because he felt so betrayed by what she did. I don't know if that's true. I've been dumped before. (laughs) I don't feel like attacking somebody with a screwdriver. At least not a stranger. (laughs) That was a good one. (laughs) In 1998, at the age of 53, Paul Stefani died in prison of cancer. And that's it. Well, that's unfortunate. Not really. No, it's okay. Yeah, exactly. It's okay. okay. There, There are worse ways to go. Like, I don't know, a nice pick. 
I know. That's fucked up. kind of got lucky. Wow. Well, thank you for that, Talia. I want to thank all of you guys for taking the time to listen to that whiny voice. And I don't mean my own. (laughs) I mean Paul's. If you want to get more information, look at some pictures uh, regarding this case, you can go to our website, crimesofconsequences.com. On that website, you can learn about the membership we have where you can become a patron and get access to 170 exclusive episodes not released to the public. And if you become a member on Patreon, you will get ad-free early releases of the public episodes and a whole bunch of other cool things. You can get the same exact stuff by subscribing to our Apple Podcast channel. Yes, and you can find that in your Apple Podcast app. If you have one. If you have one. In addition, we have social media. We have Instagram and Facebook, and our handle is Hardcore True Crime. (laughs) Hardcore True Crime. That says it all. We have merchandise. You can get information on that on our website. What else we got? That's everything, Talia. Is that everything? It is. I did that quick. You did. Well, thanks again, Tanya. That's because we weren't dilly-dallying. No, I got to go. I know. (laughs) That's why I actually have to leave. (laughs) No bullshitting in between. So until our next episode. Don't kill each other. Bye.